Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello. It's been 10,000 years. Been it's time to conquer Earth. years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but welcome. Uh, we are back to our game of Call of Cthulhu, playing the Horror's Heart campaign set in 1930s, uh, 1930s Quebec. <laughs> Uh, it's been a while, so I totally understand if no one remembers what was going on. I'm going to give us a little recap here. Uh, so basically, our investigators first met up on a uh, train. They were heading from New York City up to Quebec. Montreal, specifically. I had a cough there. Pardon me. Um... And on that train, they met one Mademoiselle Céline Lavois. Um, she was... Madame de Wa. <clears throat> she was, uh, appeared to be being kidnapped, or in the process of being kidnapped by a strange, burly gentleman. Uh, fortunately, though, the investigators, or at least one specific investigator, came to her rescue... Ah, uh, yeah. That and was so me. Because of that, <laughs> it was in fact you. And so because of that, um, she took a shine to the investigators, brought them to her private uh, cabin, and they all partook of some very illicit booze. Because right. it is the 30s, and America is in, t in the prohibition, uh, whereas Canada is not. But Dang they it. arrived safe and sound in uh, in Montreal. They made their way to meet up with Father Philip McBride, who is a mentor to some of the investigators, a friend. And he, the reason why he wanted the investigators to come to him was because he found what appeared to be the incorrupt corpse of a saint. Uh, mm, Saint, hang on, give me a second, pretty, I gotta look this up. Yeah, it was pretty funky, whatever it was. Saint Cuti. <laughs> so, Saint Cuti? Yeah, Saint Cutis Saint Cuti. <laughs> Saint Cuti, okay. C-U-T-I-S. Um, if I can say, I, I apologize in advance if my uh, French or any other pronunciation is... Uh, very hacked up, so <laughs> just want to give you all a warning about that now. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Um, but yes, Father McBride, while he was expanding his church, found what he believes to be the incorrupt body of Sankuti, and he showed the investigators a very, mm, shall we say, impossible sight. A human heart that had not decayed or rotted or anything or shriveled up it, at any point in any degree. Mm. It looks it looks like it was freshly pulled out, essentially, except that it was slightly softer than a freshly removed heart would be. Ooh. The investigators. Uh, investigated in the basement where the body was found. They looked at the uh, altar, sort of, basically. That was where the body was in the tomb. They investigated a stone pillow that was there. And while they were down there, they heard some footsteps upstairs. But they were unable to locate the source of the footsteps. As soon as they... Uh, made themselves aware, uh, made themselves noticed, the footsteps ran off and they were unable to find them. And that was about where we left off uh, last time that we played. There's a few details that I yep. smoothed over, but 
that and that's well, about for the all sake of is. a recap i think that was very good absolutely well thank you mm -hmm. uh so i'm iggy i am playing the keeper of this campaign um i guess we'll have folks introduce themselves just do a quick little thing as they are uh as, about what character they're playing rather so we'll start with uh Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Silversmith, tell us about right. your character. I, I am, uh, I am Kai Moon playing uh, Johnny Silversmith. Uh, Good-natured, uh, uh, hearty, headstrong, but a uh, little bit dumb and not so, uh, not so wise in certain matters uh, uh, when it comes to doing stuff uh, for his buddies and for his old friend, uh, Father McBride. And uh, anything else that may come up in uh, this lovely yet mysterious place. Mm-hmm. And you met Father McBride in in the war. Mm -hmm. You your war buddies basically, because yeah. McBride was a, a priest in the mm -hmm. war. Right. Yeah. He, we crossed paths, and then yes, we uh, Ooh. it became a huge Sorry. part of my. Oh no problem. It part of part of my uh my drive for mm -hmm. sure and uh up next uh we have warren donald please introduce yourself and tell us about your character uh-oh purple, purple. Oh. hello purple. All right. hello hello <laughs> hey. sorry hey. dang that means i've been muted this whole time anyway uh my name is purple I will be playing Warren Donalds, a quiet but pretty devoted parapsychologist. He is going along. He knows um, the saint through Cristobal. The father through Cristobal. Yeah, yeah. The father, not the saint. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm not really good at this. That, that's okay. Uh, you're... Your past history involves that a uh, cousin of yours yes. ended up having a mysterious encounter that has left him in a comatose state, and you're wanting to investigate and see if, see I if can... maybe you can figure out a cure. Yeah, that or and possibly keep other people from falling into the same fate. Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm next. Monsieur Edgar Baudrillard. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Edge. Uh, I'm going to play, yeah, Edgar Baudrillard, which is, uh, he's an artist. Uh, he's from Quebec. Uh, I'm also from Quebec, RRL, so I just fit to kind of play this uh, Frenchy, you know, um, broken English uh, speaker. And basically, Edgar is a really ugly bird. Yes, um, he has terrible, terrible burn scars all over his face. Yes, um, and he is kind of like trying to reinvent his uh, artistic career uh, by any means possible, and that's why he's really interested in paranormal things and this investigation in particular. He's uh, looking for his muse. Yes, his next big push of inspiration, so... He might be reckless in doing things for that. <laughs> All right. All right. And finally, Chris Cristobal Reyes. Please Hi. introduce yourself. I'm Jay. You know me. Uh, Mr. Reyes is from Puerto Rico. Uh, he knew... Uh, McBride through uh, the uh, university professor that took him in when he was very, well, not very young, but in his younger days. Uh, Crystal Ball has, uh, let's call it a, an extreme grudge against those who dabble in the occult. And uh, we'll see how that plays out. An extreme mm. grudge that came about because he fucked around with magic this one time and got two of his friends killed. Yeah. Oh, fuck this. Mad no one should use magic. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, that's no. that's about where we are. Jay is a little quiet, apparently. Uh, is this any better? Yep. Well, keep in mind, we're not listening to the stream. Ah, uh, yes, that's true. <clears throat> yeah, Zombie that's Cat true. says, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, I'm just going to kind of lead us in to uh, the next part of the campaign here. All right. Let's so, see what's going you, on. Yeah, you finish with your investigation right now, or for the moment anyways. And about nine o'clock, the phone begins to ring. Ring. Ring, ring. Ring, <laughs> ring. Ring, ring. Ring, uh, well, ring. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. I'll grab it. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you, you pick up the phone, and on the other side, you hear an eager Celine Lavoie. Uh, and uh, as soon as she hears your voice, uh, Chris, uh, she says... Mm. Oh, good. I'm glad that I have the right number. Uh, we are all, we all of us, we are going to go out tonight. And it's too late for you to say no. I've sent a limousine to pick you up and take you to Le Bistro d'Or. Uh, it's my favorite, my favorite spot. It's the best, the best place in Montreal. My brother, uh, Stefan, will also be joining, joining us. <laughs> Uh, there is a little bit of a, uh, how you say, dress code. You're expected in tuxedos. If you do not have access to any, just please let, let the driver know and you'll swing by one of my father's clothing stores for something to throw on for the evening. Uh, you will not have to pay for it, of course. I, I will, I will, uh, take care of, of the clothes and simply re return them and we will we will clean them for returning them to the store um mm. so she she's still on the line she's she's mademoiselle Celine Lavoie has invited you all out for a night on the town to the one of the best uh nightclubs of Ooh. the time and era what 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 you all thinking about I do not have a tux. Uh, no, well, yes. nor do I. <laughs> well, can none of well, us? Yeah, Didn't none of you have clothes, so need that's... one for this trip. Oh boy. So yeah, that's going to be taken care of by Celine. But like, ah, but yeah, uh... it's a fancy party, free food. It, I'm there. Yeah, mm -hmm. Chris is going to take a moment to deftly slip the phone into Johnny's hand and pat him on the back and laugh to himself. Uh, oh well, that's that's very kind of you, friend. I don't know why I would have the pleasure of speaking to this. Um, yes, very fine, uh, a young lady to invite us to such a fancy party and everything. I'd I'd be willing to uh, put on a monkey suit to uh, impress uh, anybody who might be there. <laughs> and 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 she she laughs and she says, uh, "Oh, it's." It's truthfully the least I can do after your assistance earlier today. Uh, just the uh, the tux the not the not the tuxedo. Uh, the limousine. Uh, she should be arriving shortly. Uh, as I said, just uh, let let the driver know to stop by one of my father's shops, and then I will meet you at Le Bistro Door. Hmm. Sounds good. I'll see you there. All right. I so... say to her in a very, yes, uh, slightly enamored fashion. <laughs> Boys whipped. Uh, okay, so <laughs> after some pleasant farewells, about five minutes after she hangs up, the limousine arrives. And then after a short trip to the clothier, some emergency tailoring, you're all dressed up in fancy tuxedos. And yeah. you get back into the limousine and motor right up to the ritzy Crescent Street uh, Club. 
Uh, he escorts you past a small queue of would-be patrons into the main entrance. He has a few words with the large man in a uniform with gleaming epaulets on. A little bit back and forth, fast in French. Uh, Edgar, <laughs> you can understand a few of the words, but uh, rather you can understand all the words that you can hear, but you don't hear much because it's kind of mumbled. Okay. And and there's there's a little bit of uh, like both English and French uh, calls from the the line saying, what do they get to get in front of Dr. Blue and Tabarnak and etc. <laughs> just, just a whole bunch of grousing that people are just cutting the line and going right in. Mm -hmm. The doorman will look the uh, look all of you over. He salutes and opens the thick, beautifully stained oak door. The foyer is simply decorated. It has a long, thin strip of scarlet carpet that leads to a coat check. Um, because you have just been all decked out, you don't actually have any coats. You just have your typical suit jackets. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, uh, just coats, no uh, tails, but just, no coats. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So at the coat check, uh, to your right, there's a set of doors that lead into the main hall, which emanates a din of voices and music. To the left, there are stairs that lead up to a drawing room, but uh, the way is closed off by a red velvet barricade that's been hooked across the, the entrance to the stairway. Uh, a waiter quickly arrives and shows you all to the table. Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle Lavoie is waiting for you. As soon as you enter uh, the room, a rush of music, conversation, and clatter strikes you all. Double doors open up. The dimly lit bar is full of affluent business people, young dilettantes, and people who have put the roar into the 20s. They have long forgotten the war and are reveling in a present so satisfying that no one can imagine that the future is important. The time is now, the place is here, and the music is jazz. Crash! The big band on the right of the stage finishes a syncopated number, but the dance floor doesn't clear. The dancers just look on and applaud. The golden five-star band quickly rewards them by jumping into a trendy number, and the crowd hops to it. Women who are enjoying their post-war independence dance around on the polished hardwood floor with a free-flowing flourish. The length of the evening dress is short, just below the knee, to go with their bobbed hair and slim cigarette cases from Paris. <laughs> Young men with slick back hair and open neck collars slide along with them in blind gaiety. It's a typical wild night at Le Bistro. The waiter leads you up a short flight of stairs to the upper deck, which overlooks the entire bar. Here, you find Celine, sitting alone at a large, circular table in the balcony's front center. You can take in the entire horseshoe-shaped bistro from this spot. Directly in front of you is the stage, which holds the band to the right and an elegant piano to the left. Between them and the stage, between you and the stage, rather, is the dance floor and the main sitting area. Each table that surrounds the stage has a dim light and lush green velvet tablecloth. There are many crowd, uh, many wealthy men and women smoking and drinking crowded around each table. Uh, everyone, please. Roll idea. Okay. I, your idea yeah. roll is your intelligence. All right. Snazzy place. I like it. Mm hmm. All right. That is a fumble. Yeah, Johnny, you have no idea. Like, you're just I like, oh, it. hell yeah. No, Go actually, ahead. you know what? You don't even look around. You're just like focused right on Celine. <laughs> I, I, I oh, could be a little girl. distracted by all of this, and then, yeah, that would be the the, the central focus, definitely. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Chris, Edgar... Uh, yeah, Chris and Edgar, you both uh, kind of realize this. That the room seems to be split linguistically with French speakers on the right and English speakers on the left. Oof. Kitchen doors punctuate the left wall 
the main bar line to the right. Edgar, you you probably are aware that that's not too unusual at this current time. Mm-hmm. It's not like by law that there's segregation involved here. It's just that's what people do. Hmm. People are yeah. keeping themselves to themselves in this in this kind of scenario. Hmm. Yeah, I, I um on a side note, uh I I uh I think in that era there was literally like kind of uh yeah, some sort of clear like separation between like English and French, especially in Montreal. And uh usually the elite would be uh English, you know. Mm. Like the more poor uh folks would be french so i wonder like i wonder how much of this is present in there but I, i'm kind of interested anyway sorry that's just a side note like because i you know it's very specific to yeah the area that, that i actually live in <laughs> it's not like that anymore but you know there's traces of that a lot so uh um, must have both french and english signs and the french must be more pr more prominent yes yes Yes, actually. Um, so, okay, so I noticed that, and um, oh wait, um, so it's separated. But is it kind of how I described, or it's just like because like French people stick together and uh... yeah, it's not like you don't you don't see français anglais like on anything. It's just they're keeping themselves to themselves. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you make this observation, but you don't have any time to speak on it or anything before Celine welcomes you all. Uh, hello, gent hello, gentlemen. Welcome to Le Bistro d'Or. Le Bistro d'Or, as in the Golden Bistro. Ah, okay. Oh yes, mighty fine to be here, my my dear dear madam uh Celine. <laughs> that's that's my best opening line ever. <laughs> and and she smiles, she laughs and titters and and says, You are my guests tonight. Are you hungry? Do you wish to dance? Everything that is here is open to you all. And she uh smiles and points down towards the bar and you see a younger gentleman talking seriously with two older men and she says that is my uh, brother Stefan uh, Montreal is undergoing a shift in power from the English to the French uh, most of the city is like myself uh, French Canadian but unfortunately, most of the money still rests in the hands of the elitist Eng Anglo Canadians. Ah. My family, the, Le the Levois, are spreading this effort to change things. Uh, you could consider Le Bistro something of a neutral ground, a place where uh, the Francophone and Anglophones are able to meet and discuss and plan and mm. that and that ah. sort of thing mm -hmm. ah. i guess oh. that, that answers my question from before <laughs> um it, it it does a bit <laughs> and as she kind of explains to you a little bit uh stefan returns to the table after finishing up and he smiles and greets each of you and says, uh, thank you for helping Celine. No, no, actually, he says, thank you for helping Celine. Because unlike his sister, his English has no hint of French in it. Mm. He's sharply dressed and as a casual manner, it puts you all at ease. Oh, hmm. I uh, turn to him and say, uh, uh, 
as uh, you know, as prominently and, and proudly as I can. Um, it, well, it is a pleasure uh, to assist your fine sister and your uh, your wonderful town and hospitality has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, it is a pleasure to meet you, Stefan. Definitely. And I give him a hearty pat on the back. Uh, Stefan, please. Uh, but Stefan, yes. then happy, yes, of course. Happy, happy, we are we're happy to happy to have you in our wonderful town, wonderful country. Um, oh. so after Celine pointed him out, uh, and but then continued her conversation. Did you all just uh, turn back and watch Celine, or you know, being polite and looking at her as she was talking to you? Or was anyone just still going to continue watching Stefan for a bit? I was approached? looking at Celine the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'm kind of, um, you know, raven eyeing the um, the bar, and uh, you, were, you you were doing doing the bird eye. Yeah. Uh, you, you you have noticed that uh, Stefan handed a note to the band leader before he returned to you. Oh. Okay. And when the band finishes its tune, the band leader then announces that the next song will be a waltz. And it ba basically the dance floor empties out. It gets a lot quieter. Young people are replaced by old people. And you know, it's just a waltz and so you can kind of put together that mm. he asked for a change so that he could have conversation with you a little bit more easily. Ah. Slow the evening down a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you all sit down and Stefan says, um, so what, what brings you to Montreal in the first place? Uh, what is it that, that you folks uh, do? Are you here for vacation? Do you have family here? What what brings you to us? Hmm. Um, well, uh, we're, we're here because we, uh, we were called here by an old acquaintance of, um, of ours and, uh, we are investigating something for them. Oh, I, I see. Well, it's good to reconnect with old friends, I suppose. Although, not sure what it would be that you may be investigating, but I suppose that's your business if you don't wish to... <laughs> if you don't um, wish to explain, certainly understand. Uh, is this... Uh, are you private? all in private investigators, or is this just you're helping an old friend out? Like, what <laughs> What is your vocation? Well, I, I kind of look at all, you know, Cristobal and um, Warren, and I'm just kind of like, not sure what would I if if it would sound crazy what we're what we're doing. So you know, like I'm not sure if, what to say there. <laughs> and you, you can just you can just tell him what your job is. You can say that you're an artist. I just kind of <laughs> loudly clear my throat and go antiquities. Uh, some of us deal in antiquities. Um, the answer. Oh, well, that actually kind of uh, uh, piques his interest a little bit, and he, he smiles, leans in a little bit, and asks, Antiquities, do you... Uh, are you a fan of, say, n novels or, you know, Orig like originals of things like uh, Baudelaire's poetry or philosophy by Kant. Do you have any any hand in any of those sorts of dealings? The originals sp specifically, of course. Yeah. It's very nice to have uh, all of it available, but I personally would certainly love to have an original of at least something. At one point, it's very hard to track down. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, speaking for myself, uh, more of a anthropological uh, focus than that. Um... Mm -hmm. He 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 goes. Ah, oh, I understand. Ah, oh, I see. He's not so much put out, so much as understanding. He he glances to the dance floor. He seems to be making sure that everything is going well. Hmm. Uh, as as he's in conversation with you all. Yeah, I uh, have sort of turned my head uh, from Celine and trying to focus on the conversation, but with sort of a vacant uh, expression uh, as I'm like seeing how much the mood is changing and uh, the conversation as well for uh, the, the from the such great uh, atmosphere and everything welcoming to uh, a bit of a a bit of a turn, just not as uh, as interested, I guess, to Johnny. Sort of well, thing. well, Stefan is certainly still. Uh, he's being pleasant and everything. He's just he changed the changed mm -hmm. the music from something that would be a little bit hard to have a conversation over to something that was more easy to have a conversation over. Mm -hmm. And okay, he certain he basically he was just excited that he might be able to get his hands on something that he was really interested in. But upon finding yeah. out that's not the case, you know, his <laughs> expectations got a little too high for him. <laughs> I see. Uh, and, and as he watches you turn to him, he, he smiles and says, and um, what have you, my friend? Uh, wh what do you do for a living? Uh, to me or? Yes. Uh, yes sorry. To okay. You, I, I, I uh, taken it back a little bit and then just uh, sort of uh, go into that. I don't quite have a job at the moment. I'm sort of a uh, man of all trades. I sort of travel about and see uh, what needs doing and what, uh, you know, just trying to be impressive without actually sounding impressive. Um, you know, going on about uh, my career with the army and uh, uh, doing private sort of, you know, traveling abouts and um how i've come across such uh such beautiful you know sort of places as such as these but not really uh taking them in for too long anywhere and he's so, like, ah you 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 were a soldier in in the war well we certainly thank you for your service and he he calls uh, a waiter over and requests uh a He's talking rapidly in French, so you don't hear it. Edgar, you ah. hear the exact... He's, he's asking for, like... Give, give me the, like... The, give me one of the good whites, please. And mm. and the waiter returns with a... <laughs> with a... An old bottle. And... Ooh. Uh, it gets poured for you. And he says, I understand that uh, America is currently under prohibition, so... You won't get, have a chance to have something like this once you return home, so please partake. Oh, and I accept it very graciously and uh, thank him again for such um, such fine spirits. Absolutely. And I proceed to down the drink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you proceed to down the drink. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, I, I, uh, it's oh, a nice God. dry. It's a nice dry wine. It's got it's got some fruity hints to it. <laughs> it's it's like 150 years old. Ooh, yes. Oh damn! Makes me uh, wish Johnny uh, would savor it a little bit more. Then <laughs> Johnny doesn't. No, Johnny's just like gulp, gulp, gulp. No, just like uh, oh, there, there, there's booze everywhere. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so great Chris, party. You, you have you have conversation. You have a good time. Um, you have a meal, or maybe some apps, some tapas. Mm. You, you know, some nice, nice little like kind of finger foody things, but they're yeah. like you know fancy, like amuse fresh bush. amuse bouche, Ooh, and yeah. and you know, time goes on. The waltz ends. They start another waltz, and then that waltz ends. 
-hmm. and another one goes and as another uh as your glasses are filled again the band slows its waltz down for a third time and glides to a stop the floor begins to clear and the waiters all start to swoop in from the sides to small tables which creates more congestion on the crowded floor there's a saxophone player he wipes his brow from the effort of his playing and then he looks intently to the floor Nkuto! he shouts everyone you look and a nondescript man pulls a knife from under his cummerbund and rushes towards a, an anglophone. But the warning is oh, too fuck. late. The assassin drives the blade deep into the lower back of the man with his free hand. He grabs the back of the victim's head and extracts the knight only to stab it again and again. Oh, uh, the man's scream is lost in the pandemonium of the hysterical crowd. The doors to the foyer burst open as the elite of Montreal scramble over each other in an effort to escape. Stefan, still watching the floor, rises slowly, takes Celine's arm and says, calmly but loudly, I think we should leave. Mm. He, he, without waiting for you to get up, he starts leading the way. He strolls down the stairs to the main floor, not evidencing any alarm. He leads you all behind the bar, and you, you can tell from here that a huge melee has erupted on the dance floor. Uh, large bouncers have come out with clubs appearing from behind the stage. Uh, and because of the confusion, it's hard to tell sides. But there's definitely two distinct groups who are fighting. One can be certain that it's clearly not French versus English, though. Oh. Um, oh, geez. Yeah, I think it was such, an, it was such a nice evening, too. Uh, what? Oh, what? man. Was nice evening. <laughs> too. Uh, Stefan has opened a door into the floor, which leads down to the beer cellar. Uh, Celine has already scrambled her oh. way down, and Stefan, he, like he ushers you and says, "We we we will we will be going out this way." Oh man! And Stefan heads down, and he be he beckons you all to come down as well. Oof! Yeah, I'll follow. Yeah, I I guess I will. I'm just bewildered, and I'll, I'll follow also. <laughs> Is anyone not going to follow? No, I, I follow, but I make sure to grab the, the, the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, brought, you brought, you brought, you brought the, the booze with you? Yeah, the leftover. <laughs> All right. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, no, that's fine. You, you, you when are you going to see a there? bottle like that ever again, right? I mean, jeez, mm -hmm. it might get broken in the fight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I hesitate trying to get an eye on the guy who was stabbed and who was doing the stabbing there's no chance it is a massive melee brawl if if even if you could see them very they were blocked entirely you can't tell right. anything i bolt okay you bolt um so stefan reaches up he uh tugs the hatch closed and then locks it from the other side. Beneath the muffled din and confusion from upstairs, the cellar is well lit. It uh, extends into a narrow hall that turns left, opens into another larger cellar where there's rack after rack of wine bottles that gleam in the well lit, uh, in the lighting. Wow. Uh, there's a locked door to the south that leads under a stage that would lead under the stage, rather, and a staircase to the west that goes up to the kitchen. But Stefan leads you to the third door, to the north. Hmm. He says, uh, we should go this way. It's just Stefan, uh, myself, and Edge down here, right? No, everyone everyone went. Oh, everyone went. Okay, so I, I kind of nudge everybody to follow Stefan, just sort of... Trusting him implicitly because of, you know, uh, how uh, how well things seem to have been going. But we, you know, things are kind of crazy right now. I don't think, you know, we should think about this too much and just sort of seek safety. He seems yeah, to know this place. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he's, he, he definitely knows where he's going. 
So I, yeah, I, I, I nudge in his direction. And everyone else is following? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We, do we know what happened? Uh, someone just got murdered, and then a fight broke out. And Stefan is like, well, let's get out of here. And I he guess goes I, down a secret passage. I guess I voiced that question to Stefan. Like, do we know? Yeah. What just happened? Uh, he, he says, I have a few uh, theories and suggestions, but they can wait until we are definitely, definitely not going to cut, get caught up in this. Uh, the hall ends abruptly at old wooden steps and a door that opens into the alley that runs along the north side of the bistro door. You surface from the hall into the alley via steps that run parallel to a loading chute. There's a single dull light bulb that illuminates the doorway and a few feet of the alleyway while darkness cloaks the rest. Huh. Um. Alarmingly, though, you see Stefan and Celine being forced back from the west by two men in tuxedos. Both of them are sporting clubs. The alley Ooh, in the other fuck. direction dead ends, and from behind you, four thugs appear from the basement. They appear to have come down from somewhere else. So there are six thugs all around you, and they Jeez. you are surrounded on both sides. Oh, boy, this has turned into a whole different kind of party now. The six men surround you all, and seeing no visible guns or other resistance on you, they slow down and to bait and dismay you before they attack you. There's a man with a knife. He places the blade to his lips and kisses it and says, That was a very nasty thing you did, Lavoie, and stupid. He got the wrong man. William wasn't our leader. And they they, uh, circle in and tighten around you. He's Whoa. safe from you. We know what you're doing, and you can't win this war. You never could. And with that, all six of them rush in. Celine, showing some surprising agility, jumps up and grabs onto a low-hanging fire escape, swings over the two men in front of her to land in the dark beyond. Two of them turn, and Stefan charges at them, and they all go tumbling into the surrounding gloom, and the other four men say nothing. They have their clubs and are ready to swing and hurt you. There's oh. four men, four men versus all the four of you. Oh, so and they have uh, clubs. I they, they do have, have clubs. Do I still have my knife on me? I was going to say, like, I, th- I think at, at a point I noticed that we're we're we've changed into uh, formal wear, so we probably don't have any of our equipment on us, right? Um, you know, it depends. You you may have. I can definitely say that you've kept a knife on you because that can slip easily into a pocket that won't ruin your your mm-hmm. your look. But you're probably not carrying your guns with you if you had any guns for sure. Oh, no. OK. All right, uh, then. Edgar has a bottle, at least. Yeah, Edgar does have a bottle. Uh, I uh... need to. <laughs> <laughs> I need to delete a couple things in the combat tracker because we're about to do combat, everybody. Hooray! Oh, shit. Oh, yeah, uh, it's going down. I don't know who these thugs are, but they're they're asking for it. They they are <laughs> certainly that. Uh, Damn. What? Uh, just uh, very, very, uh, like... Uh, exciting uh, turn of events for for Johnny, definitely Good considering time. how disappointing it was a moment ago. It's your moment, your moment to shine. That it yeah, is. It, it's turning into quite an evening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> club, club. You have a knife, so you, not you. Club. There we go. These ones are gonna be the ones you're fighting. One. Two, three, four. You gotta pull Johnny into the combat tracker. Oh, oh yeah, get me in there. <laughs> We're getting you in there. 
And there's the combat right. tracker for those at home. There's there's the All combat right. tracker. This uh, we shouldn't be on on round. There should not be rounds involved. <clears throat> how do I how do I empty this out? How do I reset you? I need one round for these guys. <laughs> well, anyways. <laughs> Why did none of you have initiatives put in? That's mm-hmm. strange. Hmm. Um, Where did these initiatives come from? Your initiatives are based on uh, your speed values and stuff, basically. Oh, you don't roll? Okay. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, they're they're denoted by uh, some you things don't... involved. You don't roll for initiative? Not in this one. That's like the most common phrase. Well, well you don't get to roll what for initiative. What sets them apart? I don't know. <laughs> My initiative second. sucks. <laughs> yeah. Let me, just, let me just have a look. Like, Why do you not have an initiative skill? I'll, I'll just... I'm just going to give them all the same initiative that because one of them had initiative, so it goes That's like fair. this. Hmm. Okay. Now to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, Warren. Yeah, it's all right. There, there is an optional rule that you can roll against your dexterity. Oh. But uh, mm. I don't know how to set that. Oh. Well, this was a uh, pretty surprise sort of attack here, so initiatives mm-hmm. may be a bit goofy, I would think. Yeah. It could well be. So, welcome everyone to Call of Cthulhu Combat. Yeah. Um, if you require it, please open your reference manual and right. look at chapter six. That's where combat will be explained. Okay. So, we start with Edgar. He's the fastest one of you. You have the most initiative. Oh, shit. What would you like to do, Edgar? You, you um, do have access to your to your uh, bottle. Mm-hmm. Um. So, you know, I, I think I I would have in my head I, I would have preferred like to try and negotiate or talk it out, but you know, yeah, I take one last sip of my bottle and then I smash it to you know. Make one one handy like, you know, you you yeah. want to make a shiv with it, improvised okay. weapon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you you can certainly do that. Uh, do you want to smash it over someone's head instead? Maybe. Oh, that's a good idea. That's very creative. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, um, I guess I attack the closest thug. Okay. Well, they're all they're all pretty close enough to you. Um. They'll get a sip of that booze though, because there there ain't there ain't much around like that. So mm-hmm. I, I I'm all for um, it. <laughs> so you you wanna you wanna brain someone with your with your bottle. So you're going to roll your brawling skill for me, please. Uh, Brawl. do I I guess I I just okay I double click that. Okay, so you you have failed your brawling skill. I'm gonna say <laughs> you were going up against Abish. Here, so oh, there's brawl. Okay. Let's roll, roll your, your. He's gonna try and swing at you, uh, since you're swinging at him. So, um, do I roll a uh, dodge? No, no. Like you attacked him, and so the his the counter is his action of he rolls at you, and so you swing with your with your improvised bottle and he dodges out of the way and brings his club up to hit you instead. And he does, in fact, smack you. He's a big guy. So Fuck. this is probably going to hurt. Oof. You take nine points of damage as you are crashed in the side. Uh, and- yeah. Wait, I, I have 10 HP. How come I, I wasn't at max? That's weird. You should have been at max. Sorry. Yeah, just just uh, put your 
Put yourself to max HP. So and... 16 and then minus 9. Holy shit. Okay, so I guess that would be 7. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, here's the thing, though. You took uh, over half your HP's worth of damage. Mm hmm. So that means it was a, a critical blow. Oh, fuck. Oof. Brutal. Uh, yeah, you, you cannot push combat roll, so you couldn't have done anything about it. Um. Hmm. Is. Hmm. Just one second here. I'm looking at the specifics here. Yeah. Um. As a technical question, Iggy, doesn't the combat thing allow you to directly apply the damage to the character sheet? Oh, yeah, probably. I'm just uh, taking a look to see what extreme damage does or <laughs> something like that. Using weapons in a fight, improvised weapons. No. Fighting maneuvers. No. Aye, aye, aye. Outnumbered. Range of throwing weapons. No, no. Come on. Wounds. Here we go. No, it's not actually under wounds. God damn it. What are you looking for? I'm looking for what major wounds do. Major wounds. Here we go. The effects. Hmm. Uh, bleed effect or something? No, so you re received a major wound, so you immediately fall prone. Ooh. You tick the major wound box. So uh. that's the one that's right next to your current hit points. Okay. And... Yikes. Sorry, you also, we need to make a successful constitution roll. Oh, okay. Ah. Or else you fall unconscious. Extreme success. You are not unconscious, but you have fallen prone. Okay. And you're not doing too great. You definitely have some broken ribs from that blow. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's going to leave uh, another scar. Maybe. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, you've done all you can, though. It's Christ. It's Cristobal's turn. Uh, I'm going to put myself in a defensive position between Edgar and the guy who just clubbed him, and attack that guy with my knife. Okay. All right then. Ooh, what the heck is this? That's a one eight hundred number. Get out of here, spam caller. Okay. Um, so you have moved between Mr. Abish and you're going to attack him with your knife. So what you're going to do is you're going to make a knife, a knife roll, and you're going to actually have a bonus die because Abish was, uh, you know, he already dealt with an attack at this point. Okay. So you roll your regular die. So you've made a regular success with that roll, and I want you to roll another d10. That is not the d10. That is a d10. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> you rolled 17 twice, so you've made a regular success. Abish cannot make a roll against you to dodge or anything. So roll damage, please. You've dealt four damage to Mr. Abish. Shouldn't it be 1d4? Um, It's 1d4, but you also have, because of your build, you get an extra damage bonus dice. Oh, okay. So four, cool. Mm. Yeah. So you have you have stabbed Mr. Abish, real good. And that's going to be your turn. 
right. it is now it is now Abish's turn. Uh, Cristobal, you just stabbed him and are standing between the guy he was going to attack. So, uh, he's what he's going to do is he's going to attack you. Uh, are you going to try and attack back, or are you going to try to dodge? Um, I'll let you know that if you both attack and you have the same level of success, you will both hit each other. If you That's try and funny. dodge and have the same level of, of uh, success, he will miss and will not attack you. Like you will, you will dodge and not take any any damage. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to counter this. Okay, so roll roll uh, your knife, please. Yeah, uh, you have you have failed. Whoa. <laughs> uh, fortunately, so is he. Oh, so you both um, like he, he goes at you with the club and you kind of go at him with the knife. But as you both try and avoid one another's attacks, you're your your attacks both go off kilter and they don't actually manage to make contact. And that's just going to be his turn. Uh, Johnny Silversmith, it is now your turn. All right. Well, I'm going to come at the uh, the one that there there are thugs threatening uh, 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 us and and Stefan, or is it just us right now? I don't know currently, the, like basically, we're surrounded, but, yeah. yeah, you're you're surrounded by these four. Stefan and Celine have exited themselves from this situation. They're dealing oh, with two thugs okay. in a different spot. Okay, because I'm concerned for all of us, but I'm I'm concerned for them too, even though they seem to oddly get away from them easily. But yeah, uh, I <laughs> turn toward the one closest to me and hit him with all I got, which uh, probably means the knife that I should be carrying as well inside of my uh, uh, my breast pocket or something like that. And I pull it out and ready myself to uh, take, a, take a stab at the guy. Uh, Okie dokie then. Um, I'm going to say then that's probably this Dan guy. You're going to take a stab at him. Yeah, yeah. I'm going after Dan. Okay, and he's going to try and punch you back. All right. So you roll your stabby stab damage. Yep. Yeah. So you rolled a fail. You could spend 13 of your uh, luck to succeed on your stab. I will spend 13 points. Uh, I might need you to not do that because uh, he the, the other guy rolled an extreme success. Oh, okay. So he, I'm definitely taking a punch from this guy. <sighs> Yikes. Yeah, uh, yeah you, you go, you go for a stab and he just like, he's, yeah, he's got, he just like matrix his, his way out of the way and he's <laughs> going for a, he's going for a, he's, he's going all for right. a punch. Well, yeah, I guess, uh, I just kind of follow through with that then and, Hope I. Uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, it's gonna be bad. <laughs> um, it's a little bad, but it's not the worst thing. Like you, like you get a good like noggin rocking. Oof. And you take five damage. Okay. Five. With, so you're you're not in regular. Oh, you said we're all. At at max, right? I'm yeah, sorry, max. you should be at max. So okay, all right. So yeah, my current, yeah, just down to seven, and it's not critical damage or anything. Yeah, you just took regular damage. Okay, all right. Oof. Okay. Ouch. Uh, did that apply automatically to the character sheet, or is it still manual? Uh, I think it I, I not, yeah, I, I I dragged it over to him in the combat tracker. Remember, Cristobal, you did not take any damage. Right. Yeah. It says seven and of, of 12, so that was five yeah. damage. Yes. All right. Ouch. All right, so that's your turn. Um, so up next is going to be Dan. 
And th Dan's right there. He's about to um <clears throat> he's about to take another swing at you. Um You can either try and attack him back or you can try and dodge. Oh. Who's he attacking? He's attacking you, uh, oh, Johnny. Okay. Okay. Uh, I I will attempt to dodge then. Okay. Hope for the, hope for the best. All right. So, uh, do I roll decks or something for that? Or you you roll dodge. I roll dodge. Yes. Uh, there we go. Hiya. That's 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 that's, that's a fail. Ooh, yeah. That, oh, yeah. That's uh, not looking good. Could be better. Uh, he he punches you, and you take another four points of damage. You you're hurting, hurting Gordon, hurting. Holy shit! I I haven't uh, haven't been hit this hard since the war. <laughs> okay, up I next think. here is going to be Richard. And so what Richard is going to do is he's actually going to try and, like, come in and try and grapple with you, Johnny. Uh, unfortunately, because you've taken a an action against defend, like defending against someone, you're not able to this turn. And so he also gains a bonus die on his his uh, his brawl skill, his ability to do that. And Jeez. of course, they didn't give him a brawl skill. You can use Dan's brawl because whatever. So he's he's going to try and grab you in, as a combat maneuver. All right. So I can I guess he gets a bonus die. break out of this or something. I don't know. Ugh. Um. Sorry. One second here. No problem. Uh, yeah, he he tries to grab at you, but um, he is unable to do so because of uh, he he's just a little bit too he's unable to just grab you. Manage to you manage to shake him off of you. Oh, okay. And up next is Saul. Saul is is uh, he is with you, Warren. So you're able to uh. He's he's coming to you. He's gonna try and take a swing at you. Oh, okay. Uh, he's he's gonna try and uh, he's gonna try and punch you. So, do you want to try and dodge? Do you want to try and fight back, or what? I'll dodge. Okay, you're gonna try and let's, dodge. Let's do this. Do I roll first? Oh uh, yeah, you We're roll. Back. All right. It doesn't matter which, because it all depends yeah. on. So you both like he failed on his attack and you failed on your dodge, but that means that you didn't take any damage. Ooh. Mm. Nice. Yes. And so that's his action in war and it's now your turn. So yeah. what the situation that we currently have is Edgar's on the ground. Abish is uh He's kind of in target with Cristobal. And keep in mind as well that... Uh, so, like... Uh, let's see here. Yeah, no. Abish is currently the only one who... hasn't reacted to someone. Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, I'm was... sorry. Abish and Dan are both the ones who have reacted to something this round. So you would gain a bonus die on attacking them. Okay. But I would imagine if someone is coming at me, I'd probably be focused on them. So I was going to try to grapple. What's his name? The dude that just attacked me. The dude that so just attacked you? It's Saul. 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 
I'll okay, you want you want you want to Saul. grapple with Saul. Okay, yeah. so you'll make a brawl roll for that. Brawl. Okay. No. That's oh. not too good. Um. So, oh, yeah, I didn't expect it. For all. <laughs> I <laughs> expect it to go. Ooh. If you what? want to open the combat tracker, it's under tools. Oh, okay, yeah, I didn't know how to really do that. Oh, combat tracker. <gasps> there it is. Yeah, okay, so you you try and grapple with him and fail. And it, that's oh. unfortunate. Hmm. That was a good try. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Kind of kind of crazy stuff going on here. Jeez. It, it's a little bit. It's a little bit. And this escalated. It did. It did. So the first round is over. All right. And suddenly there's a loud bark. And one of the, these thugs is knocked over. I'm going to say that it was Richard, the one who tried to grab you, Johnny. Oh. There is a big Newfoundland land dog. Oh, man. And it has knocked this gentleman onto the ground. And the dog on the stunned man's back makes a quick snap of its jaws, severs the man's jugular vein. And then viciously, oh. the dog jumps at a smaller man with a knife who slashes the big black dog over the left eye. This beast ignores this entirely and strikes with bared fangs, ripping out the second man's throat with a powerful savage bite. And blood spurts Jeez. everywhere. Uh... The other men wow. drop their clubs, which bat bounce and clatter on the cobblestones, and then they run away screaming. Dripping with blood, all is quiet for a moment in the distance. Police sirens are approaching. Stepping softly, this Newfoundland dog backs away from you, the matted hair around its muzzle and feet dripping with the blood of its fresh-fallen victims. As wow. the dog studies you, you can see that uh, the man with the knife left a wide gash through the animal's left eye. Oh, man. Kind of an unlikely savior from this situation. Maybe. What do you do? Any of you? Uh, All of you? Oh, wow. Uh, I... The answer can also be nothing. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to not true. do nothing. Uh... I'm going to tear my sleeve and try very carefully to see what I can do about that. Yeah, it does does the dog react to us? Yeah, does the dog, dog react to us like approaching? Yeah, and, and, and if you approach him, it, it snarls and exposes large blood-stained teeth. And then uh, yeah. it looks past you into the darkened street beyond and runs off in the direction that it came from. As wow. you turn, you see Celine helping Stefan to stand and walk into the light. Um, the darkness that still covers his face doesn't block out his wide eyes, which glow in emerald green. They narrow to slits, and then when he walks into the faint light, he blinks and everything seems normal. Wow. Uh, oops, okay. you need to roll a spot hidden, actually. Uh, <laughs> Ev everybody? Everyone roll spot hidden or ignore what I just what you just heard. Spot <laughs> uh, hidden. There it is. Okay. Whoa. Wow. Not and at all. Then, like other rolls. Wow. And then a roll of pow times five. Uh For who? Anyone who made a successful roll. Okay. How do you do pow times five? That's me. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I'm not entirely sure what pow times five means here. 
Hmm. Power? Yeah, power. Definitely power. Oh, yeah, the times five is confusing. Yeah, like, wait, are you supposed is to... the value that... Uh... Hmm. Oh, hang on. Uh... So you would multiply power times five and then roll. Yes. Okay. So you're, you're trying to beat your power times five? No, you want to roll under your power times five. With your power die? Yeah. Okay. So, so everyone like rolls a, power. That kind of seems like a given, though. Yeah, like... Like, I'm just looking at Warren here. His power is 60. So that's 300. So it's impossible to roll less than 300 on a power roll. Yeah, that has yeah. to mean something else. No, I'm I'm looking at it right here. Uh, like characteristic times four or times five or times six. Example: power times four, strength times five. Uh, use regular difficulty level for characteristic. Okay. Well, all right. Let's just Warren. You you notice that Johnny. You also notice that, and you're not sure what to think of it for a second. And then uh, still <clears throat> kind of bewildered. And Celine, uh, she asks for help and points out the bloodied left arm that she's wrapped with his coat. Oh, jeez! I, I rush over. I can do something. Stefan. Well, uh, I was Stephane's... gonna say. Uh, 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 Edge is still on the ground, like knocked I out. I, I think I he's, got him. He's not that. knocked out. He he was he, knocked to the a, ground, but was not knocked out. Yeah, but like he was the first I saw. It took a serious hit, but but you're saying uh, Celine is injured as well. No, Celine is not. Stefan oh. is hurt. Oh, Stefan Celine was hurt. asking for help, and but Stefan is saying, "Just take me to the family doctor. Just take me to the family doctor." Mm -hmm. And uh, so, okay. Well, I go over to edge then and try to see if he's okay try to get him up along with whatever else because the dog has run off we we're you know has has the situation yes kind of... Every, everyone has run off you are you are entirely fine here okay. could, um, I, could i explain that his injury could be s serious and i can at least like check to see if it needs to be dealt with right now uh yeah Stephane's. He doesn't uh, want to. Yeah, be yeah, no. He's, at. he's like, just get me. He just wants to go to his doctor, he, and so no questions. Uh, don't get in first aid. Just get me to the family doctor. Okay, I tell him that I could administer first aid now, but he he really wants to go to his doctor. Huh? Stefan says, "You are not my doctor." <laughs> I'm very oh. sorry. Oh, all right you, then. You did not tell me you were a doctor. I'm going to a doctor. I'm right. not a random dude. I appreciate you're trying to help. <laughs> right. It, it, it's it Canada has, has free health care, sir. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> I, I, I had nothing to do with uh, trying to um, uh, impress Celine also uh, further and, and making sure that uh, I was taking good care of everybody. But I'm 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 in a foreign land where I I'm, I'm quite beside myself with uh, <laughs> with many things that seem to be happening. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh, so yeah, we we got to get him. Uh, he's got to get to his doctor, and we'll just get ourselves uh, get out of this place. Uh, doesn't seem well, to be a great spot to be staying in right now. Is his driver like still outside the bistro or? Um. Yeah, we had just, the cars just, take just, us in. Just, so y'all, y'all, y'all need to give me a minute to finish this scene here before we move on to the scene that comes after. Oh, that's all oh I'm saying. Okay. All right, all right. Uh, uh. So as you're leaving, uh, you'll you will be passing over the body of the man in the midnight blue blazer, the one who supervised the attack. Okay. 
uh, uh, I look over him as we're walking around and try to make sense of what his connection to what just happened was, uh, uh, even though I don't really understand it, or at least suggest it to someone else. Roll a spot hidden, please. Okay. Spot hidden. Hey. Okay. Uh, so make sure that you tick a success. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh yeah, anyone who did a brawl roll or anything that succeeded, make sure that you've marked it as a, uh, you've marked your success so that you can did roll anyone, for advancement Did any later. of us succeed? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Jay did. Oh, okay, cool. Again. And also, same for the dodge skill. Uh, I think Warren, you dodged successfully, so mark that if you I, haven't already. I did not dodge successfully. He just oh, no, missed his right. attack. <laughs> yeah, you both missed out, that's right. Um... Okay, so Johnny, uh, you notice as you're um, you just like the adrenaline is pumping through you and like, yeah. you notice an odd white powder on the cuffs of his blazer and um, you hmm. quickly notice like as Celine and Stefan are making their slow way out of the alleyway uh, that there's some under his, his fingernails as well. Wow. Um, All right. You can take a handkerchief and, you know, scrape a little bit out. Yeah, if you want I try to. to take a little bit to uh, kind of parcel up, you know, and uh, at least have a good look at it later because I have no idea what what's going on with all of this and any okay. clue would be appreciated. OK, so you, you grab a you grab a little bit of the sample and. Okay. Um. You are all heading on out. Uh, before that, can I check the dude's pockets? Uh, I'm going to assume he has pockets. Yeah. What's in his pockets? Is... He's got nothing in his pockets. Identification. Mm. Nothing Doesn't... in his pockets. Okay. <laughs> there okay. was the billy clubs and, and the weapons that they had with them. But, yeah. you know. Huh. So also, like, just as an aside before we leave, um, the the dog that came in, uh, you said it was a, a large, uh, like, Newfie, Newfoundland dog. And, yeah, uh, Newfoundland dog. Yeah, and it, it, uh, it, was there anything odd about it that, um, like, you said it had sort of a, was there anything uh, noticeably different about it? Yeah, it was just a great big Newfoundland dog. Uh, you didn't notice anything in the moment. Okay. All right. Yeah. Everything was just. Oof. Oh, yeah. It was. It was wild. a whole bunch all at once. Yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. Okay. So we didn't notice anything else from that, and and the guy, I've I've gotten the sample, and I'm I'm pretty satisfied that we just head back and try to get some rest after all this. Um. Uh. Yeah. No. For sure. Uh. I mean, yeah. Here, allow me to... You've added a browser source. Ooh. Hey. Yeah, I'm, I'm sharing for everyone. Here's here's a picture of the death in the alley. Um, <clears throat> So, you took a moment to in examine the man with the blue blazer. Oh. Aww. It's a Newfoundland dog. Good pupper. So, that except... All black and also with the left eye like gored out because it got cut. Ooh. All right. Just tragic. Um, so you Very. leave the alleyway. Celine is waiting there with three taxi cabs. Uh, she says that she sent uh Stefan on ahead. Mm. And you're in you're in the bright lights of Crescent Street here. And she says, Uh, these cabs will take you back to the church. Please. Don't mention anything that happened tonight to anyone. There is... She sighs. There's a lot more involved than you realize, and I am so sorry for dragging you into this. If you want to know more, please um, wait until after my grandfather's funeral uh, at Mount Royal Cemetery at 2 o'clock tomorrow. After that, I can take you to see my father, and he will help 
clarify a few things. And he also has a request for you. I would have asked you earlier, except, well, we didn't, certainly did not expect for this to happen. All right. That, that sounds good. You, you have a date for tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a funeral, so. Oh, uh, well, a date's a date. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <laughs> just, What's the just, male uh... equivalent of a thought, by the way? Listen, I'm, a, I'm just a simple guy from a simple place that likes simple things. That's all. I play a straight guy way too well. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I have an uh, issue with that, I guess. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, okay, well, um, anyways, unless anyone has any, uh, any things to bring up before we leave, uh, I'll, I'll move us on to the end of this, this little bit here. All right. Um, so the cabs zip through the kind of hauntingly empty streets of Montreal and deposit you at the Church of saint Quitty. Before you enter, um, you hear the familiar sound of a carriage clicking its way down the stone-paved street. As you look, you see that same pale, gaunt-faced driver who drove you from uh, Vigerasse Station to the church. He stares at you fixedly before urging his horses onward and into the night. Mm. Very nice. Got a quick clack along the uh, the ground there. And that is the end of day one of this scenario. Ooh, all right. So congratulations, everybody. You survived relatively intact. Yeah. Um. So, <clears throat> elephant in the room, uh, Edgar has received a powerful <laughs> blow. So Ugh. there is some wounds and healing that we need to look into here. Um. Yeah, that sounded pretty rough. So the effects of a major wound are. If you roll, end up at zero HP, you are actively dying until that major wound is healed. Okay. Hmm. So yeah, you you need uh, immediate assistance, I think. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. I'm just taking a quick look at the rules here. Mm hmm. Um. I'm wondering major, if... major wound recovery. Yeah. A constitution roll should be made at the end of each week of gain time that the major wound is ticked. Okay. So week wow. Yeah. Um however, you are able to provide some first aid if anyone has the skill I can explain how that works real quick. Mhm. Mm the first I aid must I be do. delivered within one hour, which will grant grant one hit point recovery. It can only be attempted once with subsequent attempts constituting a pushed roll. Two people can work together to administer first aid with a success granted if either of you rolls a success. Or it, it doesn't apply when you're treating a dying person, sorry. Ah. Uh, well, um, I have... Pretty good first aid rating. I don't know about anyone else, but I would I would definitely attempt to uh to you know keep him stable. I have a yeah. decent first aid. Uh you should two should both work together on this as long as one of you rolls a success. Um Okay. So I'll roll that now or one HP. Yeah, roll it now. Okay. Okie doke. Yeah. Ah. Uh. <laughs> okay. Good. Hard uh, success. Hard success. Uh, make sure you check your first aid skill. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Got, I and got you, Edge. You're going to make edge. it. Edge, you recover uh, one hit point. Good. Good. 
Uh, so you've recovered one hit point. However, you still are um, like you you have taken a hard blow. You're stable, but uh, it, it it could in fact it still will affect you for a little bit. Mm. Um, treatment of injuries using the medicine skill will take a minimum of one hour and can be done any time after damage is taken. Uh, but if you don't perform it on the same day, difficulty level will be increased. Mm. And if a person who is successfully treated with medicine recovers 1d3 hit points, in addition to first aid points. Mm. Um, yeah. Now, multiple of you did get hurt. Uh, Johnny, you're actually hurt the most out of anybody, so you should yeah. probably do some first aid on yourself as well. Uh, if anyone else wishes to assist with first aid, yeah, as well, I'd, just, just I'd, roll. I'd like everyone should probably roll first aid. Someone, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I could use it. Uh, let's see. Darn it. You could spend eight points to succeed and gain a tick on your skill of, when, of your luck. When does luck, like, refresh, or if it does? Because I've, um, I've used quite a bit of my luck to... Uh, basically, I I'm gonna have it be at the end of this this air quotes day. Mm. So you're just at the very end of it now. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna push that because it's only two luck. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pushing it. it is rolling a second time. Oh. Uh oh. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to spend luck, you spend the points of luck. I'll spend the luck. You spend the you spend the two points of luck. And so you've made a success and take a point. Uh take your take your skill rather. Oof. Uh Warren, are you gonna spend eight points of luck to uh succeed or no? I succeeded. So uh, I guess I'll hold off. Okay. Unless unless I can also heal a point. Yeah, anyone who's taken yeah, anyone point. who Anyone who has taken damage can recover one point with first aid. Okay. So I oh. should attempt to heal myself also, then. I thought um, it was good to, I don't know, however many attempts or something. Um, no, because Crystal, to... Crystal Ball succeeded, remember? Okay, so yeah, Chris, he succeeded. Crystal Ball gave you one HP. Okay, all right. So you are now from three to four. All right. Letting me. Okay, there we go. And right. so it's it's nighttime. And you could spend an hour making medicine rolls to increase some of these HPs because uh, a couple of you are still pretty low. Mm hmm. I don't have a single point <laughs> in medicine. Yeah. Does anybody uh, have any points in medicine? I have see. a three, so that's not likely. I, I have some, actually, so I can make an attempt. It's not very good, but I can definitely try. I have one. Huh. So uh, 18, that, yeah. You could spend... Let me, let me tell you. You... Spending 18, that means you have an 18% chance to gain back more luck. Because you're about we're about to roll for luck success. I I will spend the points for this. I definitely need it to, you know, come back from from this. So I'm gonna Yeah, I'm gonna put these in and, and definitely go for for this uh the success. Alright, make sure you tick that as a success. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I guess here's the thing, too, is remember, in this case, if you're failing a medicine roll, all that means is, again, right? Well, no, I'm talking, um, oh, I, okay. I, I just want to let me finish. Sorry. Any Anyone can make an attempt on the medicine roll. If you fail that medicine roll, you can back off and not suffer any consequences. It's only when you push a roll that there will be consequences. Hmm. Okay. So, I, 
anyone and everyone can make some medicine rolls because you might you might get lucky as long All as you right. back off when you're like this is definitely beyond my ability to help nope all right, so if I can get critical <laughs> success. Which is possible. <laughs> okay. Oh, nope. I'll back off. I rolled three 60s in a row. Good lord. Okay, so Johnny, because you spent 18 luck, you success succeed on healing yourself a bit. Um, You roll 1d3 hit points to recover. So roll a d6 and a subtract d6. three if you're over three. Uh, it's a so one. you've recovered one. <laughs> Okie dokie. Artichoke. Five. That's, <laughs> yeah, almost, uh, almost half. Coming back a little bit. Mm-hmm. 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 Ah. <sighs> and so regular damage recovery is relatively fast. Those of you who have not sustained a major wound will recover one HP per day. Um, mm. However, Edgar, who has taken a major wound, will have slower recovery. Uh. Uh, so you know what? You could, Johnny, you could uh, not heal yourself and instead of have healed Edgar up an extra point. Uh. I, I will let you swap that over. Okay, yeah, I will definitely give the point to Edge. Damn. Thank okay. You. Oh, absolutely. So, we're we're in this you're... together now. We, you know, I I I got to get you through this now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Sorry, I'm just taking a quick look at major wound recovery here. I'm hoping that there are, uh, you know, some nice amenities and things uh, back when we're recovering with such, you know, nice food and, and drink oh. and everything else. A major <laughs> wound is healed and you erase the major wound marker when a character either rolls an extreme success for their recovery or when their current hit points have recovered to half or more than half of their hit point total. So because first aid, that first aid roll gave you up to eight, that actually healed your major wound. Oh, so, you, so I, I uncheck it? Yeah, uncheck major wound. And Good. there. Good job, everybody. Yay. Yay. All right. <laughs> we did it. I don't We're care alive. if that's not how it's supposed to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so okay. So, exciting confrontation. <laughs> yeah. So this is going to be the and you'll have a full day's rest. So everyone heal and one extra point of damage. All right. And next we're going to get to character advancement. Hi. So. Anything that you have checked as a success, what you want to do is you want to roll each each uh, skill and you want to roll higher than your current rating. So as an example, Cristobal has a yeah. fighting brawl skill of 28. He wants to roll a 29 or higher in order to improve with this uh, improvement check. So just double click the, the yep. skill. Yeah. You rolled 41, so you've success you have successfully succeeded on your uh what shall I what's the word? Improvement check. So you roll 1d10 and add the results to your fighting skill. Uh mm. 1d10. Third mm. from the right. Add six to twenty-eight. It's thirty-four. And do the same for all of your checked skills. Hmm. Edgar, you succeeded 
on that check, so roll a d10. Of course. You now have, you oh. now have 11 psychology. Uh, how do I? Oh, I oh yeah. You'll need to go into your edit list bot in order to bump it up and put them in the third column. Okay. Good mm. job, Johnny. So you succeeded. Roll a d10 and add that to your uh, uh, first aid skill. Okay. D10. Hey. Nice. So, 50, 59. Ah, oh, I failed. You, you did. You succeeded, which means you failed. Yes. <laughs> ah, darn. Warren, you succeeded, so you failed. I failed. I failed, yay. My eyes <laughs> do not become sharper. No. All right, those are my two checks. Yeah. Medicine. You failed your medicine, so congratulations, failed. you succeeded. I succeeded. All right. Every scene's going up six points. Six, six, six. Woo! Damn. It's not letting me change the. Uh, the oh bell. yeah, you need you need to go into the edit list feature. You got to like click the flathead screwdriver. Oh, okay. Edit the oh, and then menu. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, yeah. so I've just been adding the points to the third column. Nice. Yeah, that's that's about yeah, right. Yeah, that's probably okay. I put it in the third. Um, so wait, what did I need to roll for medicine? Uh, you roll you roll a d10 to increase. A ten for that. And that's how many points you increase. So nine. Ooh, wow. Okay. Uh, let me find that. Uh, medicine. There it is. I'm there, and then I think I just had one other. Get out of the edit. Oh my! Oh no, I had psychology and spot hidden actually. So do that. You fail. Good job. So yay! <laughs> That's a, another ten. I'm assuming. That's a two. So and then add two points. Add two there. I'll do this one now. Spot hidden is a fail. All right. Well. Spot hidden is one. Psychology is two. Oh, okay, and that's it. All right, there we go. There we go. All right, then. And everyone also, uh, you want to roll your luck skills, and you want to roll higher than your current luck for the same advancement of your luck skill. Damn. All oh, right, thirty-eight. Everyone who has failed rolls ten and adds that to their luck. Rolls ten. And technically, I should have let you do this uh, at the end of the last session as well. Oops, sorry. So <clears> everyone, <throat> everyone, once you add your points again, roll it again. Roll another ten now. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Well, another check. Do that backwards. Yeah, you gotta you gotta actually succeed on the improvement check before you can increase it. Right. Uh, there we go. Okay. So that's another one. Ooh, just barely. Twenty-six. Excellent. Everyone's feeling more powerful. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, sanity recovery. Uh, you can, in fact, gain some sanity points 
if and only if you can spend time with an aspect from your backstory. Uh, it's a page on page 167 actually has this. Uh, well, I'm Krista Ball is out my with, with <laughs> his, uh, McBride. You know, we're here in his place doing his. Yeah, stuff. he's not. He's not actually oh, here though. He, he, Remember, left he went the mansion for an appointment or something, right? Yeah, he went out for a thing. Yeah. He has not come back yet this evening. But I'm saying that everything that we are doing involves him when he is a part of my backstory. So he's okay. I I, I get how you're gaming it, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> but no. What you could do Fine. is you could have that small carved stone idol and you can just you know chill out with that a bit uh i just have my uh childhood friend who's not anywhere near me so i don't i don't have any option for this i think i mean you could phone him uh that's true i have to pay international call though right um yeah it, um I'm that actually would thing, influence the but... money that i have right because we all have i have to pay for it uh, you need to tell, you need to look at what your, um, uh, spending limit is on the day. Your spending level is $10 a day. It's not going to cost you $10 for a little chat. Oh, um, okay. All right. So then I, I give him a ring. Yeah. Um, also make sure everyone that you click off your, your, uh, success on your skills because you've checked and improved them. So you need to uncheck them again. Um, <clears throat> how much time do, do we have to, you know, do our thing? Um, like... basically you have some time this evening or a little, or also kind of as a little time in the morning. Mm -hmm. One of those two things okay. as impro for improving your sanity. Um, so since my studio is in Montreal, like I, I assume it's probably close by. So I, I hop in there and just kind of uh I go and grab my camera. <laughs> yeah, you, you yeah, um and that makes me feel good. Yeah, like you you feel good about coming back home. Uh you obtain your camera and <laughs> you like you you like probably like Oh, he I have an idea. I have a, I have a good idea. Mm -hmm. On how on how you recover your uh your sanity edge. Okay. You 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 you've got a uh, like a horrible bad bruise on that side there, mm -hmm. and it's but it's opposite the side of your facial burn, mm. and so you're gonna you're gonna use your your camera and you're gonna do like oh yeah this is such good art, <laughs> it's like duality and shit, <laughs> and you're and you're gonna like set up a little photo shoot for yourself that evening and that that exploration of art yeah. and what art means uh, to you is going to be how you recover some sanity. Uh, Damn. That's interesting. That's, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. All right. Uh, I just need to double check and see what you roll for your self help. Self help. Increase in current sanity points. Okay, so self help. Uh, make a sanity roll. We you've role played the outcome, so, or rather, we've we spitballed what it is, and. I want you to make a sanity roll for me, and if you succeed on your roll, you gain 1d6 sanity points back. Okay. Uh. Oh! If unsuccessful, you lose one sanity point. <laughs> oh wow! I must, re I must revise some aspect somehow. Okay, so. Um. Okay, just just give me a second here, because mm -hmm. I was focusing on Edgar. Um. 
So, Edgar, you lose your sanity. You lose one point of sanity for that. All right. And let's see. We were using your meaningful location. So, how am I going? How am I going to mess with this a little bit? <laughs> so, your meaning, your meaningful location is your studio in Montreal. And like you're going all in on on your artsy fartsy bullshit. You're um, <laughs> you're, you're you're taking photos of yourself, but then you know really you kind you you kind of <laughs> think on it a little bit, and you're like, "Damn, I just almost got killed in Montreal in my home." Like you you've had similar situations before, where you've been in danger, but it's never been so close to home, mm-hmm. and so. Like you're here in this studio and you have your you have your uh camera with you. But like you kind of feeling like you're not safe here anymore. Hmm. Like you're not you're you're not sure that anything that you leave here will be will be safe and protected. Hmm. All right. I, uh... <laughs> Tra- trauma. Trauma. A, a, li- a little bit of trauma and PTSD from this, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I guess specifically, you're worried that people may break into your home and take your stuff. So you you have an urge to like get a really good lock on on it and like get maybe like a safe to put all your nice things in. Like you're you've got a little bit of paranoia about your possessions that you leave there. Yeah. And so let's see here, Johnny, uh, you succeeded, so you roll a d6. Cristobal, you failed. So you would lose one sanity point. Whoa! And tell tell me what you were what you were doing uh, to try and do some self help. Uh, I was just sitting there staring at the little idol that I have, thinking back to my university. Well, not my university days. My days at the university working with the professor. Hmm. Hmm. Um. You're going to be looking at this. And this is a carved stone idol that's used by Bruharia practitioners as part of demonic rituals. And it's precious to you because it was given to you by the professor. However, this is going to come into conflict with another aspect of yourself, which is evil magic in society that must be rooted out. It serves no good in the world. It and all of its practitioners must be wiped from the face of God's good earth. So why are you holding on to this? And so you're going to... uh, You're going to take this stone idol. You're going to take a hammer and you're going to smash it into rubble. Aww. (laughs) <laughs> and what you have done is you have now lost a treasured possession which you can replace later with a new one in the future but you currently don't have a treasured possession because you destroyed it uh. because like <laughs> you you just got so angry and you were like fucking magic this is bullshit. Why do I have this fucking thing? And you smashed it. And then you're like, oh, but the professor gave it to me. Yeah. It was looking at you funny. <laughs> I, I like how you're filling it in for me. Yeah. It it scared me a little bit. But there you go. Oh. <laughs> because I was about to start nope. typing and it just went. <laughs> it's goodbye. Okay, so Johnny Silversmith, my friend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You uh you you called up your buddy. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, you, and so who who is your friend? Let's wow. look at this real fast. I uh, called into uh, my old classmate Chris, mm-hmm. uh, who uh, was a good friend of mine uh, after high school. We were pen pals during my various excursions and conflicts, and uh, it has been a friend in my hometown, uh, someone I identify with and uh, have a very deep connection with, considering that I have no attachments anywhere else, really, aside from people like uh, Father McBride, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, the, he, I call him up and I guess talk to him for a good long while, not... Uh, uh, sparing some details of of what's been going on, but trying to impress upon the uh, yeah the intensity of um, what's been going on the last few days, I guess. You met a cute girl, and there these douchebags <laughs> tried to start a fight with you and your friends. Yeah, and I tried to I tried to save them, but uh, we got we got messed up real bad. And then this dog came out of somewhere, and yeah, so you're talking yeah. to Chris, and he's like, "Holy shit, man." I did. Uh, Montreal sounds sounds like really really dangerous. Keep just you know, look after yourself, man. It, it, it'd suck if anything bad happened to you. And so, from yeah, like yeah. Sh- from sh- from sharing your like a little bit of worries and your short term stresses with your friend and his empathy, you you gain you roll the d six there, and so you gained uh, uh, Got some sanity back. You gained yeah. five points of sanity back. Nice and. Good buddy. And so this is, as this is the end of the chapter, I'm also granting you Keeper Award uh, for everybody. Everyone will get to roll uh, 1D, let's see here. I think maybe D4, but let me, let me think about it. You Mm -hmm. were, you were brave standing up and fighting for Celine more than once. Hmm. So... Uh, yeah, they wanted to be proportional, so I'll I'll give you uh, all a roll of one d four to increase your sanity. Oh, okay. D four. All right. There you go. A four. Up Good in the job, 50s. everybody. Thank you. Nice job surviving okay. this crazy time out here. <laughs> it, it is a bit of a crazy time. That is for sure. We okay. Two stories going on. And so we're, we will be starting day two, everybody. Okay. Uh, may I request uh, just a quick break? I need to grab my charger for my laptop. Absolutely. Uh, you know what, everyone, go ahead, take a little bathroom break, get yourselves something to drink. We will reconvene in maybe about five minutes. Okay. Yep. I'll All take right. my dog out then. Okay, be back soon.
I am back.
<laughs> it's a good looking screen though okay everybody yeah so after that exciting evening you you return to the church you make it to your beds um about what time do you get up in the morning like it's it's been a long night but what are hmm. you gonna do oh uh... <laughs> I'm like teeming with questions and and suspicions and all kinds of so I don't think I sleep too well. I'd be up fairly early, ish seven six seven o'clock something like that. Okay, so you're getting up early. Uh, hmm? um, <laughs> I'm probably hungover from all that booze because I I finished that that bottle of wine by myself, you know. <laughs> Yeah, oh, while yeah. taking photos okay so i don't know you're you're not wanting to wake up too early uh what was everyone's whole situation vis-a-vis -vis wake up um uh, i'm probably up relatively early because i'm just really upset about the fight last night and really curious about the whole preserved heart thing. Any okay, questions? so seems like Edgar sleeps in a bit uh, when everyone else is kind of up at the regular time. Yeah. Or early time. Yeah. Was anyone going to just try and wake up Edgar? Probably not because he was... <laughs> pretty injured so i would i would imagine he needs to sleep i'm okay. not gonna push him yeah all right so edgar congratulations everyone lets you sleep um i'm gonna give you an extra hp for that <laughs> um so father philip uh has left early early to do his daily parish duties and instructed Madame Danjo to prepare a hearty breakfast for you all. Uh, crepes, rich maple syrup, and strong black coffee. He's also left a note for you that says he's not going to be home until the evening. And you may wish to start uh, your search about uh, researching Sankuti at the Bibliothèque Nationale du Québec. Hmm. Um... You have the morning paper with you for breakfast, and as you glance through it, you see that um, the events at Le Bistro d'Or are not reported anywhere. Like, not even buried, like, a few pages in. There is nothing. The event has been covered up. But you do see that there is a funeral notice for Lucien Lavoie. Hmm. Yeah, sounds like someone would have at least heard some of that. Yep, yeah, it, it, it's been entirely covered up. Um, there was also a message waiting for you from Celine uh, that gives you the time and place for the funeral. And it indicates that uh, Jean-Claude would like to, her father would like to see all of you once the funeral is over. It'll be easiest if you arrive in your own taxi at the cemetery and then follow the Lavoie cars back to the mansion where discussions can be held. Um, those of you who have awoken early will be able to take part in some researching mm. while Edge is napping. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yes? Uh, did, you, did you add the point of HP already, or do I have to do that? Oh, no, I didn't. You Please do yourself. Okay. Perfect. If you, if you want to take part in the role play, you will have to sacrifice that extra HP. I think I'll sleep. <laughs> uh, all right, then. There you go. They'll take me later. <laughs> for not dying. Right? Probably. Well, I don't uh, take the initiative with uh, researching anything myself because I'm fairly clueless. So I just turn over to uh, Cristobal and uh, Warren and see if there's anything I can assist them with. Okay. Um, well, you are, are you make we... your way. 
Okay, yeah, that was going to be what I asked. Yeah. Uh, Y'all, I guess, make your way to the university. Uh, Université de Montréal. Um, it was recently established, relatively speaking, in 1242. Um, oh, no, sorry, the Bibliothèque Nationale, not the University de Montréal. Um, so you make it to the university, and... Uh, the exploits of saints are closely followed and well documented by the church. Although QT is a little known, there will be books in the Bibliothèque Nationale de Québec that document his life, as do texts in most library. Um, alternatively, the lives of saints are a staple for Catholic bookshops. Uh, there's memorials that can be found for sale in general bookstores as well. Um, but if you're heading through to the uh, just right to the uh, place. Literally just had it in my head. Bibliothèque Nationale du, du Québec. Um, I'm going to ask that everyone who's at the uh, the library make a uh, uh, library's use role. And Cristobal, it, I also want you to know that it's incredibly freeing for you to be, enter a library because you've been banned from several libraries in several states for various I was uh, banned in, in, in shenanigans. One, <laughs> once. One once. No, I'm telling you what happened in the in-between times. <sighs> <laughs> wow, you forgot about those. <laughs> I'm in. Regular success. Regular success. Excellent. Uh, Johnny, also roll as well. All right. Check your successes, folks. Library use. Holy <laughs> shit. Wow. Uh, check I, check uh, your success and... Really... Um, I really know the, the Dewey Decimal System or whatever it is here really well, I guess. All right. You you don't know much about books. Yeah. But, but I still know how to find the right one. You are you are <laughs> directed via impossible <laughs> impossible locating luck, just like just just hone in on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even um, need to bother the librarian. Yeah, no, I was going to say, like, maybe he there was like a very, um, you know, pleasing looking librarian <laughs> and he used his uh, cutting uh, charm. Yeah. To find to his way in there. Find my way over. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll return this on time. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. I'm just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. <laughs> okay, so this is found quite easily for everyone. <laughs> it says Sancuti was born in England in 1458. Christened James, his parents died when he was young, and he grew up in the Holy Heart of Mary orphanage. The name Andrews apparently marks his place of birth in London near St. Andrew's Cross. At age 13, he was adopted by one Houtum Kuti who became James's guardian and tutor until the young scholar took priestly vows at the age of 20. He is now as often Kuti as James, taking his guardian's family name as his first name. Uh, his energy, intelligence, and piety won him quick influence in London, and then in Rouen in France, and then finally in Rome. In 1509, while on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, he performed three miracles, healing of a dying man, calming a storm, and sleeping on razor-sharp stones to confound the mockery of unbelievers. He returned to England, where a small cultist formed in his favor. In 1516, he again entered the Ottoman Empire, and it is there that he was martyred for the faith. He was beatified, er, beatified in 1547 and canonized in 1591. That he died a martyr no doubt helped his cause for sainthood, but his life 
also provides the necessary qualifications. He was affirmed by the Holy See. The requirements include the saint's reputation for his sanctity, the heroic qualities of his virtues, and proof that he worked two miracles. Francis X. McDowell, Petals of the Rose God, the handy reader version for the lives of the saints. And the name James of Andrews was on the stone pillow in the basement. And if you check it against uh, parish christenings and enrollment at the Holy Heart of Mary Orphanage, uh, you you make your way into the rare back room, which holds a complete set of documented diverse records of the city of London and the institutions within it between the accession of Henry II in 1154 and the death of King James I in 1625. In the 18th century, these were faithfully transcribed and published in subscription by a committee of British antiquarians. In 1899, the Prince of Wales gave a complete set of these excellent volumes to his soon-to-be dominion in North America. These books are enormous leather-bound folios in a set of 101 volumes, each about 3 inches thick and 30 pounds in weight. All are in fine print and without indexes. The British Museum also holds uh, two additional complete sets. All other known sets are incomplete, missing one or more volumes. Uh, the text alternates without apology between late Latin, Greek, medieval French, and increasingly modern English. Uh, I can do language rules if I want to. Hmm. Hmm. No. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at some other things here. I'm going to... <clears throat> I'm going to reward an extreme success, this extreme success here a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to let you know that uh, Based on a date that's in another part of the volume, James, or Kuti's tutor and guardian, was Hautam Kuti, the foreign trader who was said to be a Muscovite, who also died in a fire when James had turned 17, although he was he went by the name Kutis by then. There's much more information in the Vatican archives, certainly. You don't have any contacts in Rome, though. Hmm. And you spend a fair amount of time here, but you can't make too much headway before you realize that you have an appointment to make. You have a funeral to get to. But you have successfully found the books you are looking for and will be able to return to the library and research them uh, at any point in the future. Just I'll let me take a note down here. Probably take one of them out. Yeah. Oh, no, they're not going to let you take those books out of the library. Oh. Well, what about, like... Uh, these are, these oh, are well, like, wait, complete sets. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, he's he's the one... Um, I, I'm... This, this is probably incorrect. Uh, Montrealite? I don't I don't know. Uh, but he he's, you know, maybe, maybe he has a library card. No, but they are not, not like, these are not like regular card. These are not regular books. These are, this is one of only two complete sets of 101 books. We are not letting them leave the library. You can research them all you want. They are staying here. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, that's not happening. Boy, it's a shame uh, Edge isn't here also because of his... Uh... Uh, Im impressioning and uh, uh, other uh, skills that might come in handy right now, but uh, you know, them <laughs> breaks, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. What do we do about this, Jay? You're probably uh, you're probably the best for tackling this right here. I would think. Uh, I would assume that we transcribe some of this stuff. Uh, yeah, you you definitely have notes and stuff, but 
you haven't found the information that you need, you will need to research these books again later. It's just that you haven't had enough time to research fully. You'll okay. be able to come back later. You will be able to... You know the books. You have notes of what you have studied. But you will need to commit more time than you currently have to make it to the funeral. Right, right. Hmm... Well, I don't know. There's, I just have the one clue that we found in the alley, so I don't really know if we can do anything with that. Or that that requires yep. access to chemistry sets and shit. Uh, yeah, library doesn't have that. No. Uh, ba allow me to be cl to clarify here. It is now time to leave the library and <laughs> go and okay. go to the funeral, All you right. can come back later. <laughs> All right. I mean, it's nice in here, and I found that book really fast, but I guess we need to get to the to get to the funeral. Yes, you do. Yeah, All right. so your, your girlfriend is going to be there, and you got to make your oh, move while the body's oh, still I... warm. <clears throat> yeah, well, yeah, I guess that's, that's part of it or something, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So you you all you you go back to the church, you rouse you rouse Edgar, yeah. and and he he wakes up a little groggily. He has has some fast breakfast, and you all just call a cab and you assemble, get ready for Lucien Lavois's burial. This is a man that you didn't know, but it's Celine's uh, grandfather. So. Well, yeah, we have to pay our respects and uh, offer what comfort we can. Mm hmm. So you assemble. It's a 25 minute drive to the flourishing green graveyard and a 10 minute walk to the grave site. On the far side of the overturned earth, there is a sobbing Jean-Claude Lavoie. His son is on his right hand, his daughter is on his left. There's 30 or so mourners gathered in a semicircle around the grave. There's a priest at the head of the coffin reciting a passage in Latin, and then everything falls into silence. Uh, roll idea, everybody. Oh, okay. <clears throat> idea. Is about That's power. basically your intelligence. Yeah. That's intelligence, right? Your, okay, your yeah. That's idea there. Yep. I'm looking at skills. Oh. <sighs> Okay, every one of you who rolled a success, you realize that uh, Lucien's other son, Jacques, you met briefly at uh, Viger Station, is not present. Uh, a gentle wind lifts some of the yellow leaves of a nearby tree and carries them to rest on the slowly lowering coffin. The funeral ends, and many of the mourners walk back to their automobiles. Passing by, Celine stops, and she tells you that you should follow the Lavoise back to their home. And she returns to help her still weeping father. Uh, is... Stefan, okay, on the other mind. hand, seems to be removed as he scans the cemetery. Psychology checks, everybody. Uh -huh. I <laughs> Oop, nope. Sanity? Psychology. No, psychology. Whoops. Psychology. Yep. <laughs> Oops. Sorry. Nope. Uh, okay, never mind that. Okay. Everyone, if you rolled a success on your psychology, uh, check it and. Just Warren, um, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Warren, uh, you, re you see that he's kind of a little bit wary and agitated right now. But, um,. I would be wary of him. His eyes were weird. <laughs> he 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 takes off. Um, because you waited for Celine, you find yourselves at uh, the rear of the procession. Uh, everyone, please make a luck roll for me. Oh. Ooh. I am not seeing. Nope. Yeah. 
Oh, nope. there it is. I won again. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yep, yeah, no. Mm. <laughs> That's all we're getting, getting from that, I guess. So, I noticed that Stefan is standoffish, right? Uh, he's, he's like, agitated a little bit right now, like something went wrong. Uh, remember, his uncle is not there. Yeah. Yeah. Can I bring this up to Chris? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. I feel like I would be closest to Chris's or Chris right now, because I kind of I kind of want to mention the eyes to somebody. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely so, do so. So yeah, I kind of want to walk over to Chris while we're at the funeral and mention to him how Stefan is just yeah the way he's acting is is catching my attention and. I also mentioned how that night I could have swore his eyes were cat-like, would you say? Glowing? Glowing green with slits Glowing. for irises. Not normal. No, they did not they did not have slits for pupils. Like he's oh, he did. just he just narrowed his eyes to slits and you like oh, you can see the glowing. Okay. I misunderstood. Okay. So they're glowing green. Yeah, they're, you're just a little bit, little bit glowy green. Yeah. So I'll kind of say that like under my breath to him. Hmm. And I'll nod and say, in kind of in tone, let's keep an eye on him. Yeah, I agree. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh. Okay. Um. I my notes. So you continue walking along, and everyone roll luck again, please. All right. No, I'm big money. Hey. Congratulations. People succeeded. Nice. Um, so, as you... Edgar, you're just like looking around a bit, and luckily, you managed to see in the corner of your eye a large black Newfoundland dog watching them from a far hill with a wagging tail. <laughs> ah. And as soon as it sees that you've noticed it, it, uh, Stands up and it it uh, tries to like it looks like it's like walking over to where the grave was. Mm. Do I uh, I kind of notice this too because like I, yeah I you, had a, you had you had a success vision. yeah yeah. And that's like, we recognize the dog? Yep, you, you, you seem to recognize the dog. It looks a lot like the one that uh, helped you out last time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know, I just kind of nudge uh, the three other people, you know, uh, hey, like, what is that? What is that about? <laughs> yeah, that's weird. I mean, I'm sure that this dog wasn't. No, nah, I'm not even. Gonna... I, I'm at a funeral. I can't. I can't try to lighten the mood or anything. That's. Uh, I just sort of acknowledge the dog coming along and take take notice of. Yeah. You know, try try to figure out if it's exactly the same dog we saw or if it's just a common kind of dog that maybe is a stray or something. I mean, I it, it, you have to get closer to it in order to figure it out because. Well, I I, I try to stay close to it without approaching it. Or at least follow its movement, I guess. Okay, yeah, yeah. You're, it, you're, it, you're it, heading in the direction. It, that you're yeah, heading the it, direction it's going. 
Yeah, and it's going toward uh, the gravesite. Yeah. Okay. Once it once it once it's got your attention, like, and you're following it, it's it's leading you that way. Okay. And you know, once you get close enough to see it, you definitely looks like it's the same same dog. It's got uh, the the gash through its left eye seems to have closed up neatly, like it's been stitched. Huh. That's why. Uh... So Johnny and Edgar both noticed that. Yeah, I mean, did you guys told everyone about the dog? Is is anyone? Well, yeah. Who I all kinda, is following the dog? Is yeah, the I'm following here. the dog. I want to see what's going on with this dog. Okay, you're following the dog. You definitely know it. Notice that. Anyone else who follows the dog will notice it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I go too because I'm like, yo, what's what's going on? <laughs> yeah. That's weird. It's, it's the same yeah, dog. It's Looks a like series of many strange occurrences, and this is one that's happened twice, like in in two days, basically. So I'm yes. I'm very curious about what this is about. All right then, um, just the two of you. Yeah, I'm kind of focused on Stefan over there. Okay, you're keeping an eye on Stefan. Yeah, I'll uh, get to see. Yeah, make sure he doesn't do anything funny over there all right so the, the two of you who follow um uh you you follow and uh the dog brings you back to lucian's grave and the big newfoundland dog uh, kind of like paws and scratches at the headstone and oh. you, you should realize that uh dog probably wants you to uh to have a looky loo at that because you have Edgar, I'm going to just uh, give you it, this whole thing. <laughs> the translation, because I, I don't yeah. know crap. <laughs> Love avec trois gens indique la bonne voie. Ne fait jamais un beau grimace que le cabot ne restera pas. The three-legged bear points the way. Never make a bowl frown, for then the raven will not stay. Okay... I ask Edge if he translated that right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, like a, a riddle of some kind. Mm hmm. Do you, I guess. Yeah, it looks like a riddle to you also, I guess. Right? It, it, yeah, it absolutely does. Like it's it's the same. It's word for word, basically. Oh, okay. uh, uh, roll psychoanalysis. The two of you. Both of us? Okay. Yeah. Psychoanalysis. Oh, I have one point in that. <laughs> Oi. Yeah, you kind of get that. Uh, now roll occult. Occult. All right. Oh, fuck. Nope. <laughs> no way. Y'all two have no idea. Um, no. No. Like you, you can you can make a note of what it says and share it with, with your friends later. For yeah. them to have rolls at it. Yeah, I guess just you should write it down, and uh, we'll try to figure this out later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do better um, than that. I take a picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I have my trusty camera with me. You will mm. like that. That will need to be like developed that'll take more right. time than just writing it down right right <laughs> yeah you're right okay okay but um all right i i write i, I guess i'm gonna write it down yeah. rare 1920s polaroid <laughs> yeah true it's, it's, um, it's not a very uh 1920s reflex i guess yeah uh so anyways um once you've you notice it the dog just like lopes away and like, it easily evades you if you try and follow it. It disappears at the edge of the cemetery. So, um, yeah, right. And you just, at this moment, you're just, you're not sure what the fuck is going on with that. But, uh, you catch back up with your friends, and... Um... I'm just going to ask 
just so I don't forget about it later, that you other folks um, make psychoanalysis rolls and occult rolls. So Warren, Warren and Chris, please. Psychoanalysis and occult. Okay, uh, Warren, tick your hard success. And Cristobal, also tick your hard success. Um, the both of you... Success. Yes. Uh, no, it's a hard success. You can spend eight to make an extreme success. I'll do it. No, you don't. There's no point in okay, it. Okay, I, I won't do it. Fine. 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 <laughs> It's trigger finger for you're, that. You're doing it too good already. Just, just let it be. <laughs> um. So y'all can't, like, you don't get anything from the psychoanalysis bit of it. But both Warren and Chris, kind of looking at the, uh, looking at the translation, kind of get vibes of that. This epitaph is like some kind of warning or something. Just that you're not you you don't have you don't have all the information about just yet. Okay. Um, but you need to get going back to your cab before the Lavois cars are, are too out of out of the way. So you get back into your cabs. You 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 drive on, and and after a few moments, you can see from the windows of the huge. Uh. Uh, allow me to just stop my sentence entirely and just read what they wrote here instead. Oh, all right. From the windows of the huge Fieldstone Mansion, one can see the bustle of Montreal and of the river beyond. Jean-Claude had it built in the Second Empire style to honor Napoleon III and his dreams of glory. With its false, false mansard roof and segmented windows, as well as projecting pavilions, the mansion is the centerpiece of the estate. There are two other prominent buildings, a smaller mansion belonging to Jacques, and the relatively modest guest house in which Lucien stayed. Your car follows the Lavois vehicles up the circular drive to the main entrance of the large mansion. <clears throat> uh, inside, the Lavois go to their rooms to change out of their funeral attire. Uh, the butler will guide you all through the grand interior to arrive at Jean-Claude's study. Uh, he seats you all, offers you drinks and cigars, um, at compliments of Jean-Claude. And then will, uh, disappear, leaving you alone. Uh, does anyone take, uh, take part in the, uh, offer of cigars and beverages? Uh, of course. Yes, yes, indeed. I, I have a glass with, with Edge. Oh man, the, the big cigars, yes. Yeah, the, the two of you with the big cigars. Hello, Gamma Cube. Welcome. It's Call of Cthulhu. Yeah. Uh, Warren, Chris, how about you? Are you smoking up? Are you drinking up? Nope. Nope. Straight edge. Straight edge. Lots of calling, Toad. Mm. Staying away from the alcohol. <laughs> Me? Uh, no, no, I, I, was, I was quoting from that house party video game. Oh. <laughs> do, 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 do. <clears throat> okay, anyways, uh, you're all left alone in the, in the room after you've obtained or abstained from cigars and uh, alcoholic beverages. Um... Extending straight back from the hall door in the room is a heavy, wine-colored, leather-covered desk and a series of windows tower along the back wall, filling the room with ample northern light which reflects from the polished floors. Uh, this being the back of the mansion, which is to say the north end, Jean-Claude's view is over the finely trimmed gardens that will uh, make up most of the estate. Celine soon arrives and takes a seat, and then uh, Jean-Claude arrives. She introduces um, each of you in turn to him. He, She remembers your names precisely. Damn. 
and some small talk follows. There are several fine Watoas gracing his, his walls, and uh, Edgar, you are an Arkeist, so you notice an oil version of Les Jaloux, uh, which is to the world known only as an engraving. So Ooh. you have there's an oil copy of or recreation of it. <clears throat> oh damn! So yeah, I kind of I kind of lose my shit a little bit, but you know I I try to keep my cool, blow some uh, you know cigar smoke around around there. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. But, yeah. Keeping it nice and casual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fills me with uh uh admiration, I guess. I don't know. Yes. Um so as he sits at at his uh at his desk, uh, all traces of his graveside sor- graveside sorrow have vanished. Uh Jean-Claude is himself a man of medium height with a round face, a classic uh Gaelic nose. Short, short black hair. He usually wears an expression of tired intentness. In his plain blue suit, he seems out of place compared to the opulence and guilt that surrounds him. Uh, and he looks to you all and he says, I thank you sincerely for helping my uh, daughter uh, during the incident on the train. Yeah, I uh, uh, thank him uh, for the nice hospitality and uh, be- being able to be of service and uh, everything along the lines of uh, <clears throat> trying to uh, help his beautiful daughter. Uh, he uh, thanks he you know thanks you again for that and. Yeah. Um. You know, there's a little bit of small talk. Um. Hey, hey, guys. You just came from his dad's funeral. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, we've tried to offer condolences. Uh, well, he. There we go. Yeah. Uh, well, the whole thing's a little awkward considering we've been moving around through this, uh, you know, the, the, this this uh, family uh, uh, series of events, really, kind of quickly. So we, uh, we try to offer condolences, even though we're not, uh, you know, not, not from around here and just so on and so thing. forth. Yeah, just sort of casually, like... Uh, you know, not with a great degree of, uh, I don't, we know, like, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, I just try to keep things casual myself, not really knowing how else to approach the situation. You just say, I'm very sorry for your loss, like a regular human being would. Well, yeah. Is what I was getting at, mostly. <laughs> yeah, I guess. It's just an offset by a lot of, uh, crazy stuff going on, so, yeah. Well. Anyway, I'm he, sorry, sir. he will, he will, no, that was like, that was not him grilling you for it. That was me well, <laughs> grilling okay. you all. All right. Yeah. Like... We're, we're terrible people. Yeah. Yeah. We, we could just be, be, you know, uh, be gracious to this man who's, who's, you know, lost, uh, you know, his father and, and everybody had to, uh, you know, go through the procession and everything. We could just be, yeah, we, we could just be a little bit more uh, understanding, I guess. Yeah. So. All you did was just say, very sorry for your loss. And then, see, I was just fishing for that bit so that I could say my bit, you see, that I have written here. He, uh, he thanks you. And for just a moment, that, uh, a little bit of that sorrow seems to come back through. Like, he, he seems to stop himself from, from, like, his voice, like, shaking or whatever. (laughs) And... He clears his throat yeah. and uh, does not show, like, he obviously does not show any weakness. Mm-hmm. If anyone wants to, they can roll psychology or psychoanalysis. 
All right. Mm. Dang. I know this is uh, probably for naught. Yep. Nothing. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, how do I fumble psychology? You both I've, fumbled. I fumbled yeah. psychoanalysis. Yeah. We're just that... swept up in this emotional conversation here. It's just sort of overwhelming no, to the no, senses. No, no, no. Hang on, hang on. Let me think here. Huh. I gotta decide on how. I'm positive that, like. How do you, what do you get out of this fumble on your psychoanalysis? Okay, both of you come to the same result. This man is faking. This man is faking. He's, he's not upset that his grandfather died or that his father died. He's happy about it. And you know what? You know what? Th this man's a killer. Oh, shit. Oh, oh. That, that's what, that's what this fumble tells you guys. Uh, and oh, no. like you, you're convinced about that, and instantly you're just like, "Oh no, what this have we gotten is, into?" This is some crazy stuff just sort of coming to a head here. Uh, this guy's something's going on here. Well, you don't do, you you don't think that? I don't. Me. No, 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 no. What's this dude's name again? His name is Jean Claude Lavois. Jean-Claude. Jean-Claude. Jean-Claude? Oh, yeah, Cloud, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> Jean Bazou. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is quite the conclusion to come to. Uh, this is because they rolled fumbles. Therefore, I'm going to give them entirely the wrong uh, impression. impression. Okay, yeah. But they have to act on it. Yep. Or they have right. to at least... Right. Right. They it's have to at least so. take it. It's in your notes, and you're positive that this is the case. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, he might be on uh, the, the something's wrong with this, and then something might happen to, uh, 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 Madam, uh, uh, this is not a, remember, Kaimun, yeah. this does not yes. apply to you. Okay. You don't, okay. you're not thinking that at all. Like, you're, you're, right. I'm, just, you're I'm overzealous. Totally normal. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Lavoie doesn't waste much time. He speaks slowly and deliberately um, with some labored breathing. He seems to be physically ill, but uh, that illness has not affected his keen mind. And he says, I do not know why you are here in Montreal, and furthermore, I do not care. I do care about my family. Celine believes that uh, you are a group of intelligent, compassionate people, and your reputations, which I have taken the liberty of inspecting through my agents, proves that to be the case. I <laughs> feel that I can trust you, and I do not make a policy of trusting people. You helped my family once, and I want to ask your help again. What I'm about to tell you is unbelievable, but the truth nonetheless. My father uh -huh. is trying to kill me. His father, mm -hmm. who is dead. I'm going to continue here. I was uh... just pausing for I was just pausing to give you all a moment, but I'm continuing. Okay. He tells yep. you. My father, Lucien Lavois, moved from France with his wife, Claire, and one-year-old Jacques in 1857. Two years later, they had another boy, André, whose death the following year remains unexplained. I was born in 1862. The family lived in various parts of northern Quebec until 1878, when, Clara di when my mother, Clara, died. My father began to lose his mind shortly after. Lucien blamed me for Clara's death. When he became violent, it was necessary to flee. I hated the northern life and my father, so I went I came to Montreal. 
aided only by my dreams of success. Twenty years later, Jacques joined me, mainly for the sake of his son, Pierre. I did well in business and quickly acquired McTanish several years before Prohibition passed. Lucien, my father, stayed in the north. I sent him money, but never heard from him until four months ago when he arrived unexpectedly in Montreal. His appearance on my doorstep was kept quiet. Neither myself nor my father, or myself nor my brother, trusted my brooding father. I put him up in the guest house, but he remained distant. I consulted with specialists at the Royal Victorian Hospital, but my father went completely mad three weeks before his death. Mm -hmm. One night late last month, the butler saw my father wandering around the halls of the mansion, lightly swinging a hatchet at his side. Followed Lucien up the stairs to a gallery, where Lucien stopped and suddenly buried the axe into a portrait of myself. Afterward, Lucien was taken to the hospital. Intensive examination discovered a brain tumor. His mental state declined over the next several weeks, and he refused to leave his bedroom. In the last days before his death, Lucien, now incoherently mad, told me that he would curse me. It was then that Lucien wrote his own epitaph. Lucien cast this curse in my bedroom the night he died. The butler found him the next day. By your backgrounds, you are very aware that magic does exist, yes? Lucien's <laughs> curse is also very real. Oh. I would like for you all to remove this life-threatening curse that my father has placed upon me. Okay. <laughs> uh, rather, I should say, that it's placed upon me and my family. Hmm. This yeah. curse affects all with, with Lavoie family blood. Hmm. Okay. There is a curse. The, the curse is structured so that none with Lavoie blood may even enter Lucien's room. Due to my position, I cannot have this situation leaked to the press. I need people whom I can trust. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so you need us to go into his room? Yes, that is where he cast the curse. And from there, we will be able to determine what kind of curse it was and how we can lift it. What happens oh. if one of your family tries to go in. We physically cannot. We are stopped and seized until someone pulls them away. Oh. Well. Is the, we'll um, try yeah. to help however we can. Uh, Ed, what were you about to ask? Uh, I was gonna say, I guess the room is is in this house, right? Uh, the room is actually in the guest house. There's the there's the separate actual physical house. Okay. Hmm. Well, sh uh, shall we try to take a look now? Uh. He says that you certainly can, though he would like to at least um, give you all the details. Oh, before yeah. Before you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. This whole thing's making my head, uh, making me scratch my head real something bad over here. He <laughs> you said he was ill. He's not like bedridden or anything, right? Jean-Claude, no, but like he's definitely like uh, he does. not. He looks physically not great. I wonder if that's but, due to the curse. You know, it's, pr you, it's probably due to the curse. <clears throat> um, 
Okay, let's see here. Everyone stretch. It, the stretch <sighs> has been redeemed. Oh. oh I need okay. If he stretch. I'm yeah. standing up to stretch. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we. Uh, there's just something about each each member of this family that is just really like none of them are particularly close to each other. They all seem to have like some kind of, I don't know, ex external issue going on for each of them. I, I, it's kind of hard to nail down right now. Well, it keep in mind that someone tried to kidnap uh, the daughter, which is related right. to the yeah, fact that she was attacked father, right off the bat when we were on our way here, which is related to the fact that this family is, are like alcohol smugglers in the States. It So it's very likely that it would be a business thing. Yeah, it's a lot of influence, a lot of power, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of effect on Montreal itself. Mm hmm. Um, uh, so anyway, Luce, uh, not Lucien, Jean-Claude. Jean Jean-Claude. Jean Jean yep. Jean Jean-Claude. Jean-Claude. GC. <laughs> Good old JC. Yeah, JC. JC. Uh anyway, he 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 tells you that uh you you cannot be injured and when the curse is lifted, you will be duly rewarded. Uh the actual lifting of the curse must be done soon as there is a time limit. Like he's been he's been growing progressively worse as the days continue. As the days and weeks continue, I should say. Oh, man. Uh, everything that Lucian used to cast the curse have been left untouched in his room. Uh, he's willing to pay you $2,000 in cash payable when the job is finished. Uh, you don't have to decide right this moment, but time is of the essence and you'd like your decision by this afternoon. Um... And he says that removing the curse should be simple. You just have to uh, reverse the ceremony that he performed. He says that he's deduced this from knowledge of his own French-Canadian folklore. He's not sure if he believes in all of it, but he does respect the condition or the tradition of it. Does he have hmm. copies of that tradition, like written down that we can have? Um, no, because all the stuff that was used to, to cast the curse has been left in the room that he can't access. Okay. Uh, um, so we'll just go in there. Can he escort us to the room? Yes, he can. But again, we're, we're still in the spot of getting all the information out. Yeah. I know. yeah. And I guess he... Uh... Oh yeah, I think I, I just want to go ahead and, and and try to see what this this curse is supposedly all about, so that we can get some answers to this madness. So unless anybody else has to ask him something, I don't know. Feel like we should uh, try and do something sooner rather than later, especially if there's a time limit. Well, what about what we're supposed to be doing with the saint? That yeah. might that might have something to do with it because why else is everything happening around this house, right? Around this 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 estate rather. Well, I mean the city, I guess. Hmm. Look, if if we're dealing with the supernatural here, uh, this isn't something we can ignore. Mm hmm. Hmm. Everything is connected. <laughs> I, have, uh, <laughs> I have no idea if this is related to that. Could be two entirely separate supernatural events. Uh, but it's one 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 of these is is already dead. So I think that one can be put on the back burner for a moment. 
This is true. The saint not going anywhere. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the saint could get up and walk around. That is a possibility that some of you have seen happen, but yeah. mm -hmm. you know, usually you'll you'll like all the information that you need is at the library, which you already determined. You know what you need to do for that, and you'll be able to figure it out later. Uh, I guess the big question here is uh, you you are all it, it, you're all accepting his offer of you mm. Mm. of uh, helping him break the curse on his family. I am. I I turn to everyone else and ask them. I'll go with everyone's decision. I won't uh, I won't force anybody into one thing or another. Oh, I'm interested. Uh, Nick. Crystal Ball is definitely interested in sporting the forces of magic. I'm going to want to see this thing in action. Yeah, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Me too. Because, of course, I think, you know, Jean-Claude killed his dad, so... I need to see if there's anything connecting my hypothesis to this story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right. So I think we're going to let that be the spot where we pause for now. Because we're, we are, um, we're coming up at a good, you know, end of stream pause point. Blip, 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 words. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I agree. we can, a nice we can mysterious cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, we can next time investigate this curse on the Lavoie family. All right. Uh, okay, we will uh, do our little sign off here real fast. But thank you, everyone, for uh, playing with us today. Thank you, uh, Kai Moon, Purple, Edge. Oh, thank you very much. Absolutely. Great. Got to see where and, this thing's going. Oh, man. And a great big special thanks to everyone who's watching, all of our subscribers. Uh, especially those who are going to be scrolling on the screen in short order. If you like what you're doing, give us a follow, uh, both on Twitter and here. If you really like what you're doing, uh, subscribe to this channel. Gain access to uh, emotes such as Pog, Fish Pog, Cat Go. <gasps> And Zombie Cat, as well as Jay. <laughs> uh, yeah. You can also catch all of our uh, streams later at VOD, at our VOD channel, which is located below. Uh, follow us on Twitter for announcements on what we'll be doing on any given day. Uh, let's see, what are we doing tomorrow, Jay? Uh, tomorrow we are... Zombie and I are playing some Alpha Centauri. Excellent. All right. So keep your eyes peeled for that. As always, we like to end everything off with a raid. So we're going to be uh, raiding Oreo, who raided us yesterday. So it's time to return the favor. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. We'll see you all next time. Yeah.